Ah. Welcome and welcome to tonight's presenters, Björn Döhler and Christian Reichert. So tonight we do not only, we have not only one, we have two CEOs of Resolution GmbH and they will tell us why passwords suck and discuss um, trends and challenges in user management um, in the Atlassian ecosystem. So thank you again uh, and welcome. And with that, over to you, Björn and Christian. Thank you very yes. much. So yeah, the trend is to have uh, two CEOs minimum. That's two factors. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> two factors. So hopefully you can see the white screen and you can see the top 20 list of passwords in Germany. So uh, take some seconds to find your matches to your passwords um, and uh, what the rank is of your passwords. Um, and maybe a question to you guys that you can answer in the um, chat, please. What do you think? Um, from which year is this top 20 password list? So give you some seconds to answer in the chat module and to find the chat module. And the chat module is also how you can ask us questions um, or the Q&A later on so that we can um, then answer them throughout the presentation, but also in the um, Q&A. Uh, 2022, yeah, that could be right. <laughs> 2020, not bad. So Jörg, Hubert, what's your opinion about this? Um, yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> this year. No, we Googled it this morning. <laughs> okay, guys. <laughs> <Sorry. laughs> You're very good. So, um, yeah, it's uh, really the case. So this uh, password list is from 2020, um, published from uh, T3N and has a Platner Institute. So I think this list is not really changing over the year, but it was simple the introduction uh, to our topic today, password sucks. Um, so we want to introduce ourselves, uh, maybe quickly. Yeah, I'm Christian Reichert. I'm one of the um, uh, CEOs of Resolution and um, uh, a co-founder in the business. So um, we've been around since 98. Um, and if you're more regular to these sessions, then uh, you haven't seen me uh, present one or two topics already. Um, and obviously the Main purpose, what we do is we are a marketplace vendor in the Atlassian ecosystem. One of our keystone apps, which we're going to talk about later a tiny bit, is um, an app to um, allow the Atlassian applications to be integrated into single sign-on environments. And hence the whole topic of authentication, of uh, user management, of uh, password security, multi-factor authentication. It's the stuff that we have to, to deal with um, essentially um, every day. And hence, we thought we'd give you um, a little bit of this rundown today, um, which hopefully gives you some good advice um, and a bit more knowledge about passwords, uh, what is a good password, what not, and um, where the industry is going at the moment. So maybe I do my introduction a little bit shorter, I'm Björn. So, <laughs> <laughs> but let's uh, jump to the topic. So um, passwords. So uh, in every company, we have a lot of passwords. We privately or personally, we use a lot of passwords. So this is a quick screenshot from a template for a password policy uh, from IBM. And so we don't want to talk about too much about policies because that's a little bit a lame topic. But at the end, this is a base for all our passwords, uh, what we use daily or create um, daily. So um, let's check some myths about passwords. So myth number one, um, are existing password policies secure? So and that's a really easy one um, because today, well, last year, not 2020, in 2019, 81 of uh, confirmed data breaches occur on password weaknesses. So that's uh, definitely place number one uh, on these data groups. So that means despite having password policies, like maybe you go to the one in the beginning, having those in place, um, still a lot of um, breaches happen because those passwords get hacked one way or the other. And we'll talk a little bit about what sort of the typical attack vectors are in a second. Um, but here you see in the default policies, and that's common in a lot of enterprises. It's like, um, you have to change it every um, 60 days, it needs to be between six and 28 characters. And I don't think anyone would 
even think today six characters would be a very strong password. Uh, and you can't reuse the last uh, five ones, have to provide some special characters, um, those kind of things. That's a very common, what I tend to call old style password policies, like you find it in modern software today. So, okay, it means the first one is a really yeah. easy one. Existing password policies aren't really secure. Okay, so let's uh, talk a little bit about number two, and um, I think that's a very annoying topic. Um, so I was always an expert to miss a point, and on uh, day 61, I need to open a ticket to reset my password. Yeah, I have, a, um, I hated that kind of policy. I, you have to change your password every 30 days or 60 days, that kind of policy. I seriously hated that with a passion, I have to say. Um, and um, I think I tried for years to convince people that it's not secure, um, at least in wherever who would listen to me. Um, but, but finally, even the US government, but also the BSI in Germany agrees and in, in their newest publications, they actually advise that um, uh, changing passwords is not really necessary anymore. But if you go to the um, next thing in terms of just what's, what's happening is you see, and that kind of policy, um, we may start off with a very secure kind of password, um, but what has been shown over time is that the amount of complexity um, does decrease. Yeah, and anyone who's worked in a company with that kind of password policy, so how often have you just taken a simple password and appended 10, 11, 12, just the month you were in? And maybe an exclamation mark. So I've done that. Um, Björn's done that, and I'm pretty sure quite a few of you would um, would raise your hand as well if you've ever been in that kind of environment. And honestly, in today's world, that doesn't make it any more secure. So definitely busted. Yeah. And I like it. That's uh, not uh, the standard anymore, and not the recommendation uh, from BSE or other. Uh, um, governmental parts. Yeah, NIST in the US is the, uh, the similar thing to <clears throat> BSI here in Germany. Yeah. And I think that's a, a very important and often unknown aspect at the moment uh, for most of the security teams that uh, this is not a secure way anymore. Yeah, I think that's also how you can, um, maybe I'm insulting a lot of security people now and then I'm terribly, maybe sorry. Um, but I always thought that um, as a very quick, quick thing to um, um, see which uh, security teams and, and customers or companies are are really good and which are maybe um, a little bit outdated in terms of um, just discussing that kind of um, policy. And typically, the people who understand how passwords get hacked today, they know that the 60 days um, and, and sort of the philosophy around it that the 60 days isn't. Um, um, a good thing to do, uh, but you still find a lot of people think, no, no, every 30 days, that's fantastic and brilliant. And I'd, I'd say they are not really up to date nowadays. Let's jump to list number three. So is, and I can't read the word. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, is that <laughs> is a password? <laughs> is this number of characters a safe password? <laughs> I can certainly tell you it's a hard to remember password. <laughs> yeah, definitely. So, um, and that's um, uh, also an important case. So, hard to remember passwords are often in notes or uh, with pen and paper somewhere in the pocket. So, um, that, that's very true. Or under the keyboard or in an Excel sheet. Um, absolutely. Um, and that's not a good way to store your password. Um, I don't have to tell you that. But let's assume that user still is a good user. He remembers that password. So. The question is, is it safe? So to clarify the topic, uh, we need to jump a little bit on the topic, okay, what is password uh, complexity? And um, also what are possibilities to crack a password? But uh, first of all, um, password length uh, very often, so we uh, talked a little bit about this. But also complexity. I think most people use combinations of uh, letters, numbers, symbols. So a S is a dollar character or something like that, um, and it should be uh, unpredictable. Uh, unpredictable. 
Um, so, and when we, or we see the password on the right corner, so there isn't something like um, the company name or uh, some stuff, social events, something like that, or Corona as a buzzword in it. Yeah. Um, let me say a little bit also why, um, and that goes into the um, next slide where I'm going to talk a little bit about um, how you attack passwords. Um, no, sorry, go back. Um, it's, um, there are different attack methods. Um, and generally, what you try to do is um, to increase the amount of time it takes for a password to be hacked. Yeah. So length very often has a factor there because the longer the password, um, the harder it is to try out every combination, which would be a brute force attack. I'm going to say that um, later. But so longer is usually better. Then what does it mean with complexity? Uh, letters, numbers, and symbols. It just means um, increasing the amount of um, um, combinations you have to try to uh, ideally guess the password. Yeah. If you know a password can only have lowercase characters, you know it has 26 characters, and you uh, or you have 26 characters to choose from, so you don't you only have um, in the case of a one-letter password, you only have 26 combinations, maximum combinations or not combinations, maximum tries. Yeah. If you have upper and lowercase um, characters, um, suddenly you doubled that amount of room. Yeah. If you add symbols to that, if you add numbers to that, um, you just add a lot more tries, even to um, hack this one letter or one character password. Yeah. And now, obviously, um, if you have, for example, 56 choices to choose from, and you suddenly go to um, a um, two character password, yeah, it's 26 times 26 if you just have lowercase, 56 times 56 if you have low enough. So um, the amount of combinations go up much, much um, higher if you have to try different combinations, the bigger your password uh, room is. And that's why you very often get um, things like the requirements for numbers and, and, and symbols. Yeah. And then unpredictability is something that's usually asked for um, for some of the, to avoid some more of the advanced attacks. Um, and that might actually be a good point to go to the next one. So there are more attacks, but generally, um, uh, sort of the more common ones um, is um, dictionary attacks. Yeah, um, that's where you um, try to, um, actually, let's go one step back, sorry. I forgot one thing which is worth mentioning, yeah. You actually see um, in the table down um, password and then an MP5 hash. Um, so if you're doing password storage in your database reasonably well, um, or the worst thing you can do is save the clear text password. Because someone gets hold of your database, he knows what the password is and can use it and try it in other services. Yeah. Um, so it gets better with um, hashing the password, and hashing is just a one-way function where you can get from a password to um, another set of characters like the MD5 hash is shown here, but it's not reversible. So um, in terms of uh, to understand, to find the clear text password to a hash, you have to try a clear text password, hash it, and then see um, if the hash matches and then you know you found the clear text password. So before you actually know what a user's clear text password is, um, you have to do um, multiple guesses or you have to compare the hashes. Yeah. So um, and, and then it gets better better password storage and also salts and peppers um, passwords which is adding some random thing that's per user or per system wide. I'm not going to go into that very deeply, but there are ways to improve password storage even more. And then applying an algorithm multiple times so that it takes more compute or more memory power um, so that you have a resulting hash um, essentially um, that takes a lot of memory or time to compute and is somewhat um, has some random factors or um, things into it. <clears throat> so now we go to dictionary attacks. So dictionary attacks, um, dictionary attacks is in initially, um, instead of trying every possible combination of characters there is, um, I know people are likely to choose 
English words, for example, or German words. So just take a German dictionary and run every word in the dictionary um, against it. And suddenly I have a lot less things to try. Yeah. And my chance, I might not find every password with it, but if I have a password database of a thousand passwords, there's a good likelihood that there's some just plain English words in there that I can find them with a the dictionary attack things. So if your password is password, yeah, that's easily found in a dictionary attack. Yeah, and that particular one or those top 20 password lists, they are at the top of every dictionary um, uh, attack there is. Yeah, uh, but then you can extend the dictionary attack by combining two or three words. Yeah, um, then we know a lot of people um, tend to um, tend to um, add an exclamation mark at the end. Yeah or at the current month at the end. So what we can then also do is, um, and that's where um, good dictionary attacks come from, they have some pattern how they modify the um, word they're trying. So instead of, if we have the word January, for example, instead of just trying January, they will try January, January 01, up till 11, January, <laughs> one book with an exclamation mark in the end, et cetera. So sort of the typical combination that we see, or this uh, lead speak where we uh, replace a three with an E, for example. Those kind of rules that goes into a good dictionary attack, uh, what people tend to do. Um, and hence, um, they then um, uh, go about and they reduce significantly the amount of tries you have to do to find the clear text password to a hash that you might have been getting by preaching some services database. Yeah. Then the um, uh, brute force attack, um, that's more the attack I described. I try every possible combination. Yeah. So instead of dictionary, I go and uh, try every combination. So A, B, C, and then the next one A, 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 B, A, C. But even those brute force attacks tend to be a little bit smarter and they are combinable with dictionary attacks. Yeah, so you can run a dictionary attack for if you have again your thousand um, password database. Yeah, you run a dictionary attack first and you might find a hundred. So you have a hundred already that you can try and hack someplace else, but you still have 900 left that you didn't find with dictionary attack. Then you can look at something uh, like running a brute force attack against them afterwards. Mm. Um, um, and even those brute force algorithms are relatively smart in trying um, better known combinations and those things first. So you do not necessarily start with A, 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 yeah. If you know most password policies are minimum of six characters, you might start with that six to 12 characters, which is a very common room and only go to other things um, thereafter, et cetera. So that is kind of, um, um, a, a brute force attack, and that takes a lot longer because you just have to try a lot more um, combinations in there. Yeah, and there's a, like I said, there's a lot of overlap um, between dictionary attacks and brute force attacks. Sometimes rules are applied on brute force attacks, sometimes they are dictionary attacks and those kind of things. But that are two very common ways um, to attack. Um, another brilliant way um, is rainbow tables. And um, rainbow tables is a super simple um, thought process behind it. I do these dictionary attacks, I do this brute force attacks. So I try something, calculate the, um, um, the hash, then I try the next one. Why don't I just save that hash in a huge database? Yeah. Next time, I don't need to do all that computing again. I just look up the hash in the database and I know the clear text password. Or you share the database with other people. Yes, exactly. And that's what rainbow tables are. It's basically computed hashes, uh, basically a brute force attack where somebody computed all the possible um, passwords and saved the hashes for it. Um, so it only takes seconds. So it's rainbow tables, depending on, on sizes, they have a couple of gigabytes, um, but can absolutely easily handle them. And as for database sizes, they're quick to find. So if you, if you have that thousand user, uh, thousand um, um, database looking them up. If you have a rainbow table that works in that case, 
that's a matter of seconds. And you know all the JTAX passwords, yeah? Um, good password storage, the right hash algorithm and those kind of things, um, peppering, solving, that can invalidate uh, rainbow tables or it can at least um, make it so that um, that not one rainbow table fits all and you need to be lucky that someone exactly compute that rainbow table that you need uh, with that salt or with that pepper. Um, so good password storage principle make that harder, but it doesn't make it impossible. Yeah. And the longer time, the more time passes, the more rainbow tables um, there are available. Yeah. You can guess stuff. Okay. Um, that would be probably um, harder nowadays. Or uh, spidering, social engineering, um, that's the kind of thing, but that's typically very targeted to a certain person, yeah? Um, spidering can be things like um, searching um, uh, someone's Facebook posts for, um, your example was Björn there, your dog's name, um, and yeah. you post happy birthday, Emmy, and then you know what Emmy's birthday is, what the dog name is. And if you're using your dog name and the birthday um, as your password, then you might just have given it away. Sometimes yeah. it's a combination. Yeah. Um, even in my family, I know too many passwords that have birthdays mostly in it. Um, and they know it better and I know it better. Yeah. So um, that's the kind of attacking via social engineering. So in that light, Björn, is that bloody password safe? Um, I would say yes, it can be better. <laughs> no, it, it, it wouldn't be a good example if it's not safe. Yeah. Finding my religion. So there has been a very common advice how to build passwords. Just think about the song you love and take the first two, three lines and the starting letters of that. That gives you two very complex looking passwords that are pretty hard to remember. Um, and even if you have to do the first in your head a couple of times. Um, but guess what? Hackers know that advice as well. So just imagine someone downloaded every lyric ever, ever written and put it um, down um, in dictionary, all the possible beginnings in, uh, in a dictionary. So you can easily get those kind of things nowadays with dictionary attacks. Um, um, and anything that works with a dictionary or pre-computed attack is also vulnerable to rainbow attacks. So this password would not be a safe password, even though it looked that way, yeah? And if I would have added a number or two and an exclamation mark, it probably would have passed any password policy there is, but it's still not a secure password. So secure passwords are sometimes harder than you think. That's why we look forward to a time without passwords. But in the meantime, um, that's still something we can do. But hey, a couple more moments. Yeah. Uh, um, as we created, or when we created these presentations, we also found out that uh, some titles like work, work, work are not so very good for uh, new passwords. Six, <laughs> six times W. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, Miss number four, different passwords um, per application. Uh, so, um, the vendor LastPass, so it's a vendor for an enterprise password manager, um, created this research and they found out that on average, um, every employee has 191 passwords. So I think that's definitely a combination of business and personal um, password, but it's a huge number and it's a huge number to remember. And hard, it's hard to remember. Um, and now I should have uh, 191 different passwords for all these applications. So um, is it important to do this? And uh, when we created the slides, I remembered to a life hack and this life hack happened in 15 minutes. It was in Austria, uh, uh, in Vienna. And um, Guy Simple took a database. It was a database from uh, Adult Friend Finder. Um, adult Friend Finder was hacked in um, 2016. And uh, the hackers shared um, the database with uh, over 400 billion accounts, email addresses, and passwords uh, open the internet. So who the hell registers on Adult Friend Finder with this work address? Um, <laughs> wait a minute, there are some surprises in it. <laughs> so um, now I don't need to be a hacker. 
I can be a script kitty or simple, I can do it on a Sunday by myself. I simply download these addresses and passwords, um, create a script or that, uh, do it manual, and, and try all these passwords and email addresses on Dropbox. And the interesting point was, and we're talking about the gold print finder. So um, this guy found in 15 minutes over 100 Dropbox accounts with these password email address and password combinations of uh, German DAX companies. And um, it was, um, I don't call the name, but um, there was also a huge company in the room. And the hacker asked, okay, should I look at somebody registered with uh, your mail domain? And yes, one person was in it. And uh, that <laughs> my uh, a former boss simply called this person immediately and said, okay, change your, pass uh, your email address and your password. <laughs> So um, yeah, it's uh, definitely true that uh, people should choose different passwords per application because if one account is hacked, it's simple too easy um, to use the same combination for other stuff. And when you simply check the implication of this aspect, the personal, um, personal cloud servers and people use the company and business email addresses and the same passwords, uh, for Dropbox where they share maybe monthly reports, uh, financial data, personal data, or customer data. It's uh, definitely a huge data breach. Yeah. So Hubert, what do you think um, as being from eBay about that? Yeah, I totally agree with all what you're saying that <laughs> it may happen like funny stuff and our current policy it changed. So it's totally different approach what you are saying. It's interesting because currently we have a password once for 180 days, but they uh, increase the amount of characters to 16. So they, yeah. they, I think there's different approach. Yeah. Okay. So I might have insulted your security division. <laughs> <laughs> can be, can be. <laughs> but but also it's interesting that our also people doing infosec change so you know the different infosec different ideas and so on so you know it best okay. um, number so five number five two factor or multi factor can avoid data breaches um, <laughs> the short answer is yes <laughs> um, <clears throat> just google for it um, as simple as that um, there I think I've seen 15 different studies um, or surveys that people have done in the last um, three months. And the only thing that changes is if they're talking about 80% or 99%. And um, it's, um, um, I think um, you can be fairly um, safe. And if you, if you even take the lower boundary of uh, 80%, um, that I've seen on a, on a big survey. Um, Two-factor authentication is probably, or if you take anything away from this talk, yeah, anything, nothing else than that, turn in two-factor authentication. If an account is important, I'll admit I don't have two-factor authentication on for everything because not every single account for me is important to me, yeah? So if there is a rare forum about rare oil minerals, I might not care. Yeah. Um, but you have a ton of this? Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> but I haven't, didn't have a good example either. <laughs> um, no, so any stupid, take a stupid game account for an IS game that, um, that I have to sign up every, um, uh, every five days because one of the kids wants it. Um, I don't turn on two-factor authentication on those accounts because if someone's going to hack the high score of that game, hell, I don't care, yeah? Um, but I still use separate passwords on those. Nevertheless, um, if the only thing that you take away is on the accounts that matter to you, your PayPal, your Facebook, your LinkedIn, stuff that people can do damage, um, et cetera, turn on two-factor authentication. Your company account, ideally, if they support it, turn on two-factor authentication. It doesn't matter if it's an SMS or something more secure. Even SMS, which has been shown to be not 100% secure if someone really targets you, uh, for most of the hacks out there where people just want the database and try the password somewhere else, they will not be able to intercept your SMS. 
So even, even those things which um, some people might say they are not the most secure ways doing two-factor, if that's a way that's supported, turn it on. It makes you much, much harder to hack than the rest of the people. And if you have another million in the database, then you don't go after the hard one. Yeah. Um, so two-factor authentication is probably the most uh, potent thing you have um, in your arsenal to be more secure. But, but there is a but. Yeah, there's a but. So now think about these 191 accounts and passwords and you enable maybe 50% uh, on 50% to factor authentication. So you will end up or it will look like this. Yeah. And <laughs> what you're saying is thank God you telling uh, to, you're talking to someone who makes his money with selling single sign-on. Um, yeah, essentially that's the problem with two-factor authentication. Um, if you have to do it very often in very many different accounts, um, it just increases the amount of time um, takes. So that's why some um, applications go the way of not asking for a second factor every time. Yeah, Think about your Apple ID. First time you sign into your browser, you get asked um, the code, but not every time you, you sign in. Yeah? First time you use a device, uh, those kind of things. Um, or, and that's, um, that's the other thing where your next example comes in, and that's the way a lot of companies go. Um, and, and the thing we certainly recommend, and one of the takeaways hopefully here, is um, single sign-on in combination with um, centralized identity management, multi-factor authentication, and then single sign-on. That can be a fantastic way of um, doing that with a great user experience in there. So, um, if you there, there are multiple case studies about single sign-on um, uh, available. Uh, Bjorn picked the one from um, NHS, and it basically is um, they used to have about one for one minute forty-five every employee spending every day uh, logging in. They measured that. Um, so having single sign-on essentially just what I mean with that is you just have to sign in once to an enterprise application and then you're authenticated against all of them. Yeah. Um, that saved about uh, across all their 5,000 employees 130 hours um, per day. That's about a million savings per year. That actually pays for a lot of um, plugins and a lot of single sign on configuration. And IT tends to get a lot of additional benefits <coughs> with a more centralized identity. Um, as well, like not having to maintain multiple accounts um, and, and a lot of um, policy and um, governance um, benefits as well. And this, yeah. uh, this strategy also increased the adoption symbol from the employees of all these systems. Oh, yes, a hell of lot less annoying if, uh, yeah. as opposed to signing in 20 times. Um, so that is um, two factor authentication is a great thing, but you also have to watch the consequence that it increases the amount of time um, it takes. So single sign-on can be a, um, a counter, yeah, time to have a counterpart against it to offset that and um, still have users love you. But isn't there something else with single sign-on? Yeah, we said um, that we should use a different password per application. So, Single sign on use the same password for multiple applications or Well, it looks that way, but it doesn't. So okay. if you go to the next one, and that is going, um, so after the session, you've heard a lot, you've learned even about SAML. Um, <clears throat> so SAML is one of the three single sign on protocols um, that there are. There's Kerberos, old style protocol, only used within Active Directory has its limitations. Um, a modern protocol, and that's the most widely adopted across enterprises, is SAML, and another one is OAuth and OpenID Connect, um, which is SAML and OAuth OpenID Connect that are the two modern protocols, and OAuth is more used on APIs, so machine to machine communication. Both will be um, still the protocols of the future if you look um, a couple of years down the line. Yeah? And both work actually relatively similar. That I, ex I explain you SAML here because the more common one, 
Uh, but if you take a lot of the ideas from here, it's the same principle in OAuth uh, OpenID Connect as well. Yeah, details are different, but the principle is the same. So <clears throat> this is one of the slides I usually use in our training for our single sign-on plugin. Um, so if someone goes to Jira and it's not authenticated, so step one, what happens? Jira would typically show you the login page. But in that case, our plugin intercepts that, um, generates what's called a SAML request, and redirects the user's browser to the identity provider. And the identity provider, that's the bit on the right side, um, that's the thing um, that knows your username and password. Yeah, and can do an authentication. So um, in this SAML request, that's a small XML snippet. We basically, in Jira, say, um, um, help, we need someone authenticated. Yeah, with this application and we need someone authenticated and that someone comes your way now. And then your browser goes to the identity provider. The identity provider can look at some things like um, a cryptographic signature in there if it's configured to make sure um, he knows who we are requesting that authentication. It can be encrypted um, that no one can read the details when intercepting it. So those kind of additional security features are. But in principle, then it's the job of the identity provider to authenticate you, yeah? So if you signed in before, so you've been to another application um, that's connected to that same identity provider and you already signed in, then he already knows who you are because you have a previous session with him. Then he doesn't need to ask you for anything anymore. He knows who you are. And that's how single sign-on then essentially works that you have you only need to establish a session once with that identity provider. If he doesn't know who you are, he's going to ask you for your username and password. And then it's going to look at, are there some additional, what they typically call policies configured? Yeah, and a policy could be something like, ask every user for a second factor. Yeah, or policy could be, yeah, mm -hmm. ask for username and password, um, but if, that user is in the administrator group, then also ask for a second factor. But it can also be things like this user can't log in from India. Yeah. Or it can be some smartness like, um, oh, that user just signed in five minutes ago from the US. Maybe that sign in from India is not valid. Or we have something that's dodgy here and we kill both um, connections. Yeah. Those kind of things. That's policies you can configure or it's only from this IP address range, only from a PC with a certain certificate, lots of possibilities. And they are, can be different from ID, identity provider to identity provider. So let, but, let me ask a little bit the teleshopping question here. So this yes, means- you can have it. Yeah. So uh, is, it, is it possible to get a knife on top of this? So um, this means an identity provider with all these policies is a potential way to create a centralized two-factor authentication for Atlassian apps, for example. Yeah, not just your Atlassian apps. Um, I mean, short answer to your question is yes. Yeah, and absolutely. <laughs> but generally, that kind of identity provider you don't just use for um, Atlassian applications. You use that for a lot of your other enterprise applications as well. Yeah. And, um, and very often customers have an identity provider already. So when, when we as or our plugins um, come into play, then very often the question is more, how do I get Jira and Confluence connected to this IDP rather than which IDP should I choose? Yeah. Okay. Um, <clears throat> but, but nevertheless, the key point here to understand in this protocol is the identity provider is the only one who knows your password and does the authentication. And once the identity provider is happy that you proved who you are and you adhere to all the policies, then in step five, he puts together what's called a SAML response. Yeah. Again, that's a bit of XML text um, with a couple of attributes. But the key thing in here is that contains your username and it contains cryptographic proof that you have authenticated. It does not contain your password. Yeah. So um, we have essentially in uh, public private key, we have the public key of the um, identity provider that we trust. Um, he has our pu uh, public key. Yeah. 
Um, and he's going to sign this um, message uh, with his private key so that we can, once the browser in step six, six goes to us again and gives us the summer response, we can verify that this um, summer response has been generated by a identity provider that we trust mm -hmm. and therefore take a username and log in as a user very simplified there's a lot more that we do but it doesn't matter to understand that so nowhere in this exchange is the user's password exchanged between let's say jira or plugin or the identity provider so the only thing that knows the password um, is the identity provider and everything else is done based on a public private key um, trust scheme and that's what makes a lot of these protocols or protocol like saml or oath are very powerful because you don't have to um, have the user's password in Jira or Confluence or Salesforce.com or any other cloud application. You just need to establish this um, trust relationship based on a public key. And um, then you can trust that identity provider. Yeah? And um, since the user only needs one session with that identity provider, once you go to the second, third, fourth, fifth, 15th application, you run through this whole process, but the identity provider doesn't have to ask you for your password again. It's mm. already got an established session with you, knows who you are, puts the summer response together and sends you back to the application. So for you, it just looks like you're locked into that application. Now you go to Jira, you run through this, bang, you're locked in and see the page you request at 200 milliseconds. If you're very observant, you've seen the URL change two or three times, but you don't realize you've just been authenticated. So that's a great user experience, but it also makes it very, very secure um, in that case. And that is the reason why this last myth is busted. Single sign-on doesn't mean you use the same password across multiple applications. Um, it just means there's a trust relationship between a central thing, the identity provider, and a lot of the other applications. But if someone hacks your JIRA, yeah, simply set and gets the JIRA user database, there's no password password in there mm. for you. Yeah, they cannot reverse engineer your password based on that user database. And that's what what make what makes it um, um, so secure. And most, <laughs> most of the attacks, <laughs> most of the attacks, what we learned before, are not possible uh, with that. I hope we haven't um, put any um, participants to sleep yet, or in. <laughs> Okay, so then um, maybe a little bit of summary of trends or um, all these busted uh, uh, things. So what are um, trends or recommendations, uh, our recommendations, but also recommendations what we see at the moment from several companies, security companies, uh, password manager companies, things and on companies and so on. Yeah, it's, and then the nice thing, just, just to mention it uh, before we go into every one of those, um, if you look at um, the likes of Azure AD, if you look at the likes of Okta, um, et cetera, which are one login, which are a lot of those single sign-on companies or centralized identity provider companies, or uh, Auth0 is one which does it for a lot of apps, um, they put out very good content and very good studies. Um, also Gartner has a, a lot to say there. Um, so um, in, in a lot of those things that you see here um, relatively, Simplified. Um, if you're interested, there's a lot of um, studies, a lot of material there, and I think what we're trying to say um, here that that really reflects what sort of uh, implementable and state of the art today. There's also trust no one things. There's also pa some passwordless um, things happening, but they're all um, a little bit further down the line. So uh, yes, there hopefully is going to be a future without passwords or many passwords. Um, uh, but what you see here is now um, pretty much what would keep you good and safe here if you implement a lot of that. Mm -hmm. So overall, um, what I see uh, a clear message of this slide. It's first decrease the number of passwords and different, different passwords um, for uh, the users, because a simple get out of this complexity of 191 passwords, um, because this invites every user to create workarounds uh, for these passwords 
and they are mostly unsecured. So implement, you said, uh, the most important stuff uh, in this session, implement two-factor authentication everywhere. Um, so this um, everywhere is definitely a wish, but definitely where it's possible. So yeah, I'm not sure if it's a wish. Um, I, I think pretty much most services nowadays support some kind of two of eight. So um, if bottom line, if if it hurts you to lose that data or for someone else to take that account over, um, then you should not. Then you should um, add two of eight. Yeah, yeah as, sim as simple as that. Um, then in an enterprise setting, um, go for single sign-on as much as possible. So um, that improves, makes your users a lot more happy. Um, it helps you with some centralized user management, um, those kind of things. Can um, be the enabler for two-factor authentication? Yeah, it is um, the enabler for two-factor authentication, or like I said, um, make, keeps your user happy. Um, and then for the rest, um, use a password manager. Use something like LastPass, 1Password. If you don't want to spend any money, um, there's open source things like KeePass, KeePass X. Um, <clears throat> on, on Apple devices, even the uh, Apple Keychain is a, is a good tool. Um, and let them generate the passwords for you. First of all, the password manager um, helps you um, um, to make your logins less painful. So most of them have browser extensions that pre-fill your passwords, those things. And by the way, don't trust, don't save your passwords in browsers. That's not even encrypted usually. Um, so use those password managers. Um, then um, uh, have them generate the passwords, like I said, um, and do that with the rest of your personal and business accounts. Yeah, if, if it's not covered by um, single sign-on, then uh, put them into the password manager and have a separate password generated by the password manager for every one of them. So minimize the amount of um, username password combinations that you have to have with um, single sign on at 2 of A. And for the rest, um, make sure you have a, a password manager um, that deals with maybe the less important accounts or the accounts that you <coughs> just can't get into that. And um, maybe um, five and six um, is a little bit enterprisey again, uh, but it's also good hygiene um, if you if you do that on on your personal accounts. Um, first of all, the, the the amount of from previous jobs or contract roles, I still have accounts that work. Me too, a lot. <laughs> so, I mean. If you give someone the key to your company and that guy leaves, do you leave him the key in terms of and say, oh, he's probably going to be okay. Yeah, I, I like him. I can, can come in whenever he wants. And <laughs> yeah, even he's got the key to the server room. Who cares? Uh, no, your keys you collect again. And that's the same thing you should do with, um, with, um, with accounts. Yeah, if that guy leaves, Close that account. If that guy moves positions, make sure you adjust the rights of the accounts. Um, have it. Um, don't ignore that. And, um, and and the nice thing is, if you have something like a centralized identity provider, you can automate a lot of these things across multiple um, applications. And that's what I meant um, earlier on. With it helps you with some policies, with some compliance, with some auditing logs. Um, if you have that centralized, then you can actually um automate a lot of these that you only have to do those changes in an idp or maybe in your hr application which replicates to the idp um again so that helps with that uh, but i said um that can also be um good hygiene for your personal accounts um yeah if you don't use something anymore then just close the account most companies nowadays allow you to delete the account you know, things, if things are not hanging around, then um, they can't get lost, yeah? And they can't get abused. And then destroy master keys, it's more about, uh, we haven't talked much about that kind of concept here, um, but it's there for completeness. Um, it looks a little bit at the, the whole domain of, in, especially in companies with shadow IT, mm -hmm. yeah? 
I can connect my Jira to Zapier. I can connect my Jira to Microsoft Flow, to my personal script. That's or some some people call it personal automation. Be 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 a bit careful with that. Um, use a good authentication mechanism there, like OAuth for example, or API tokens. Um, don't necessarily enter your Jira username and password, which is also your enterprise account in Zapier. Yeah, Zapier needs to save, Zapier actually needs to save that in clear text. If they lose it, it means someone can, has access to your whole company account and all the other systems um, to it. So be a bit wary. So if, you, if you're a Jira admin or if you're an enterprise admin, then look at ways how to limit that exposure. Yeah, um, and maybe still give limited amount of users the tools to do that in a more controlled way than Jira does out of the box. Um, but also, if you're a user, be aware of what you're doing. You're giving Sapia access to your Jira account in your company or your Dropbox account um, access to your Jira or to your Slack profile. It's, you're making those connections. They help you. Um, but they also represent the danger, yeah? Um, so be aware of that and also have a bit of hygiene around that. Most accounts like Google accounts or so, they will actually give you, or Facebook, for example, they will give you a, a relatively simple list of um, apps that you're allowed to connect. And I personally make it um, uh, a once a year when I'm not in a good mood kind of exercise. Um, to, to go through some of those accounts I use to log in or connect many things um, and just withdraw the access of all the stuff I stopped using, mm. yeah? Because especially apps that you stopped using, yeah? Those apps might not be doing that well. They might not be maintained that well. So they might actually be a very interesting target for a hacker, yeah? And if they have access to your Facebook profile, well, who cares if an app or yourself posted that new picture of something and still hurt your account. Yeah. True. So can you show us a little bit <laughs> to factor authentication? Yeah, I mean, yes, I can. Let me just uh, yeah. if you stop sharing your screen. I can share mine. Bear with me a second. And I think we named that three minute demo. I don't actually know what I should be doing three minutes there. Um, so I think you have, uh, we have over all four minutes left. Or? <laughs> that depends. Don't have the system preferences, no. Continue. So. Yep, looks good. So that, this is just our company example, yeah? So if I go to my Confluence, um, actually, let's take my personal page. Yeah. I get redirected to our Azure AD account. I can select my account. I need to enter my password, hang on. Is it the REM song or? No, it's harder than that. And you see, I can actually not remember. <laughs> no, it's... Ah. Password manager? Yeah. Recommendation number four. So that's how a password manager works. Four three six five, and then I have a token app. We have my Microsoft account. Copy the token here. So that's my second factor login, and I can now say yes, they connected. And it does that once I log in here. So if I go to our Jira now, you see it redirected me quickly to Office, but I'm still logged in. So even if I go to something like portal, office.com, where our Office 365 apps are, 
you see it redirects me quickly to um, <clears throat> I see all my apps. Um, if I go to our Ranger, I have a login with Azure option and bang, it has already locked me in and waits now um, to see our Ranger. And that's how we have, um, with very few exceptions, pretty much all our apps connected to um, Azure AD, synchronize the users, um, uh, but also have a super simple way to um, um, connect and have me authenticated. So I'm sorry for the uh, holpriger start. Um, <laughs> That's a complete bumpy, bumpy start um, <laughs> of the authentication. Good, so it was a two minute demo. So it's, uh, I think it's the first time that I see that you finish a demo quicker as the timing set. So <clears throat> we have not talked about our plugins at all um, yet. I'll just give you a little bit of an upshot about the things. Our um, major app is Samuel Single Sign-On um, on the Atlassian Marketplace, and that's really there for the Atlassian data center and uh, server applications to be connected to such a single sign-on environment um, uh, that I described before. It's number one app, got lots of uh, enterprise, very feature-rich, um, uh, but also relatively simple to configure for the standard use cases, and it's been there for ages, 2013. Um, then we have a functionality called QserSync that's included in that SAML app, but also available as standalone for other use cases. Um, that's really there to synchronize the user information because authentication is one thing, um, but you need to get the record about the user. Who's the user, what proofs does he have, and those kind of things into the Atlassian application in the first place. And that's what UserSync is about. So where we have implemented the native APIs of something like Azure AD, Okta, G Suite, one login, key cloak, um, and all that stuff to be able to synchronize your user accounts into the Atlassian application. And um, then the third application in that whole set um, that, that's about authentication or user enterprise user management is API token authentication uh, for Jira and Confluence. And it brings that API token personal um, access um, um, token or per what's often called as well um, per application password, um, application specific password mm -hmm. uh, concept to Jira and Confluence. Um, so um, it also helps with a lot of control around um, the API, so who can use it, who cannot use it, which groups can use it, etc. Um, so it's about that admin control of your API, who can connect, who can use it. Um, but also then um, in a way that you don't have to expose your normal enterprise username and password um, <coughs> in, in that concept. Mm. Yeah. And last but not least, there's a user deactivator, which manages sort of um, deactivation or removal from groups of inactive users. Um, that's for certain use cases when you can't use synchronization that you can still expire accounts that are no longer needed. So yeah. like you free up your licenses, but you also close one of those potential um, security uh, holes or leftovers um, that you don't have your accounts after you left like a year ago. When well, the offboarding process done. So we didn't want to make this uh, a big promotion of our app. So if anyone is interested in any of those, um, then um, use the URLs or talk to us. Um, we're more than happy to explain more or even invite you to a training of those uh, apps, et cetera. Um, but yeah, I hope you got something out of this in terms of password, um, two-factor authentication. Remember that is the most biggest impact change that you could make, enterprise or private. Um, but yeah, good guidance is Single sign on, password manager, different passwords for every account, um, and enable two factor and all the stuff that's important to you. Perfect. So, Jörg has already the QA background. Yes. And um, thank you very much for that. Um, and while I promote everybody to panelists so that we can have a talk, I have a question. So, how um, 
So cloud migration is currently a big topic. So if I have established single sign-on in an enterprise environment, so with an identity provider, does that help me with cloud migration? And if so, how? And if not, why? And uh, Do you mean at less in cloud migration or cloud migration so moving to the cloud in general? At less in cloud mi migration in detail and general and cloud migration in general. So uh, in, in, well, yeah, in general, it depends. <laughs> uh, in general, it does. Um, so um, Atlassian Cloud also supports via Atlassian Access, um, SAML and Signal Sign-On. Um, but if you also look um, at other cloud, typical cloud services, Office 365, um, uh, Salesforce.com, um, you name it, um, most of those, if not all of those, support um, SAML. So if you um, if you want to implement a centralized identity, then um, uh, that, that certainly helps. Uh, it also means you have control over your users, you have control over their credentials and maybe their two-factor authentication or those policies. And all those other applications can participate in that without having to know the password. Yeah. So in short, yes, it helps. Okay. So, and... Uh... Now the audience can ask questions, so you can unmute and plug in your video if you want to. Hubert is back. Yeah, so a question from my side. So we just implement, uh, installed your add-on like two weeks ago because we want to enable 2FA and SSO for eBay, for Jira and Confluence and it works quite well. So out of the box, that's good job, guys. The question is, as you said that Configuration. So what you're essentially like, saying, I had to talk to you since um, uh, 20, whatever, 2017 or something, uh, <laughs> to get you to try our app now. Fantastic. <laughs> you <laughs> know, it, it's uh, only a three year sales cycle. Fantastic. And, and <laughs> enterprise level uh, companies has their own timing. You know that. <laughs> <laughs> No, the question is uh, for what I should look like deeper, like what's your best practices? Because as you said, that configuration is quite complex and comprehensive, so you can do a lot of stuff. So for example, one of my question, do you suggest to use like backdoors, no SSO, or we should disable that? That's one of my like questions to you, or what else I should look like? Because it mostly works well, so we can log in without any issues, like to administration and so on. And no, we have a 2FA answer. also, and we have encrypted. So encrypted 2FA and SSO. So these three things. Uh, okay. Um, so yeah, guess my answer. It depends. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you wouldn't say he was a consultant ever. No. Um, well, the, um, I think that the very short answer is talk to us. Yeah. Um, I think the most important thing is we see those kind of environments every day. Um, you do those implementations, maybe even every once every years. couple of <laughs> yeah, once every three years. Um, and uh, and and that comes as part of the evaluation of our plugin and the um, uh, implementation. Um, talk to us, and we can share a lot of best practices. Yeah. Um, the question you ask um, is not a super simple one because the answer really is it depends and it sometimes depends a little bit on the policies that you want to have um, as a company. Sometimes it depends a little bit on the organization for you as a company. Do you want sort of is the IDP the central um, database of truth for you or do you just want essentially the user authentication or user records from it but want to manage groups um, or locally, or maybe both. Um, so um, that, that's sometimes hard to answer questions so categorically, yeah? Um, for example, with your um, no, S, no SSO question, if you just take that um, as an example. So um, if two-factor authentication is important to you and it should be absolutely impossible for someone to circumvent um, um, uh, 2FA under any circumstances, um, then um, even disabling no SSO is not good enough. You can still then use your normal user credentials on the uh, REST API and make a call to the REST API create session endpoint 
um, get the JSON session ID, use that in the browser to have an authenticated web session without. So for that, we have a solution that's called Deny Password Authenticator. That's an authenticator you can install. Comes free of charge with our plugin that needs to be installed as an authenticator. Um, so um, if that's not very important to you, um, and you say, no, it's more like I don't want people getting confused, then turn it off. There's a knowledge base article um, um, on our website, which shows you how to turn it on um, for maintenance cases and that stuff via REST call. If you have a local admin, just make that REST call. Um, that, with that way, you turn it on again. An admin can use it um, as a backdoor and you turn it off afterwards again. Yeah. Um, so um, that's what I mean with it depends a little bit what is important to you and what do you try to achieve. Yeah. Um, but the bottom line or the, the, the main message to you is don't just think about contacting us in case you need support or something is broken or you have a bug. Yeah. It's a single sign on can be a complex project. For many people, it isn't. It's a super simple thing to go about, but for a company like uh, yours or eBay with lots of probably complex policies, it can be a bigger or more complex project. Then talk to us. That's part of the deal when you buy our plugin, um, you get that. Uh, and we can, in, in 20 minutes, we can probably ask you most of those kind of different questions um, and then tell you, well, this is the advice we would give you. This is what we see other customers like yourselves doing, yeah? That's maybe what we've seen which didn't work so well what a customer did. So maybe don't go down that route. But that's what we know and that's what we're happy to share. Okay, so my outcome is meeting with you next, in next weeks. <laughs> <All right. laughs> Perfect, thanks for the answer. You're welcome. And it's also interesting maybe for other people that we decided to not dropping cr uh, crowd. So we are using just for um, authentication, not for authorization. So, Okay. Um, just on a side note, um, and that's part of that session, um, you can actually, um, if you still need that for some local accounts, for example, you can also, um, if it's a modern crowd, you can also add that as an identity provider in our plugin. Yeah. So um, we can also then um, take crowd as like any other IDP as a source of authentication. Oh, good to know. So one question from me, maybe to, if there's not, nothing from the audience, no. Um, what are your experiences with communicating these policies and the com com complexities to the users? So we all have been there. There's a form, generate your password, and then you have to fill it out five times because it doesn't like asterisks and the other one doesn't like a dollar sign. So how do you communicate all that complexity to users? What's your experience? Because you provide tools, but you also have enough projects where you have introduced something like that to a larger user group. <clears throat> well, I'm, I'm not sure how to answer that well. Um, I think one good thing is that the more you work with single sign-on, the less you actually have to communicate, yeah? And the less you have these differences, yeah? If, let's say, out of your... 30 enterprise applications or 40 enterprise applications, you have 30 on single sign-on. Then you have only that single set of credentials on the identity provider for all of them. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So you don't need 40 different policies to communicate all those slight differences up by lowercase, two characters and that stuff. Um, yeah, this. Um, and then, um, it certainly makes sense from an IT side, if you can configure what the policies on the app are, make sure they are the same across your enterprise estate. So for the leftover stuff that you can't get into your single sign-on, um, try to make them um, in, um, in a more coherent state. And then what I also, like I said, I'm a big fan of is um, use a password manager and then you can very often set the default of the password manager to something sensible, yeah? Like 16, 17 characters, um, two numbers, one symbol, and restricted amount of symbol range. 
that actually matches most. If, if, if you create a random password out of that, that's usually an enough complexity to be hard to, to prove false. Uh, but it also matches virtually all password policies. So if you generate such a password um, in your password manager as a default, um, then you don't have um, a lot of people who would run into um, restrictions with that. Yeah. And, and then the good thing is then you don't have to communicate a lot of differences of those password policies. Then you just need to tell them, um, so this is your central um, uh, enterprise account. That's where you get into all of these applications. For everything else, and we as a company also we use one password, for example. Um, I used last password before, also good application. In the previous life, I used KeePass. We don't do anything wrong with that either. Um, uh, we essentially um, also provide it in a way that our employees can use that they have a personal vault, which we can't access as a company. So they can use that for their personal passwords um, as well. Yeah. Um, and then it's, um, it's very simple. You only need to teach them how to use one password. You need to teach them how they use your centralized enterprise identity or what's the indication there. Um, and very honestly, that's done in a 10 minute video yeah, to tell them what's good about that. And then you don't need to communicate too many differences. You just try to pick the defaults um, and show them a way that they don't mm -hmm. run into any exceptions. And the adoption is uh, out of this a little bit self-driven, so especially the personal use is very interesting uh, for employees because they can store safely all the private and personal stuff, but also actions like um, for accounts where you don't have user-specific account where you need to share a password in some cases, that's absolutely easy with uh, these uh, password managers. And uh, um, people will figure out how it works and um, then you're more secure instead of sharing passwords in Slack or on a node or uh, um, shouting it uh, in a big office space uh, to another table. Okay. Or email. 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 And <laughs> across the internet. Great stuff to share passwords. So, uh, once again, the question, questions from the audience. Don't be shy. No. So either we have all experts or we've just been very boring. <laughs> Everybody's still here, so you cannot be done. Come on, I see Stefan there. Stefan, you must have a question. <laughs> um, no. 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 Um, maybe I have a last question. I don't know if it's a stupid one. Um, in 2020, does it still, is it still useful to set up your own identity provider? I don't know. Uh, download Forge Rock and set up your own identity provider or should you rely on you know, uh, Azure or whatnot? It depends. <laughs> it depends, of course oh, it depends. Yeah. It always depends. Um, <laughs> no, you're certainly um, tearing me a little bit apart between my uh, open source heart and uh, um, uh, yeah. So do I absolutely really think that I could be on my AWS instance, be protecting a Forge Rock server better than Azure AD can protect their stuff or um, Okta can protect their stuff? No, honestly, no. Yeah. If you're a large company and want to invest the resources that are necessary um, to have a good chance about keeping those things patched up to date, network-wise well protected, um, then you might be, uh, uh, might be worth a consideration. Um, but even for a small company like us and for other, many other companies, um, I feel we tend to like the control of our own stuff, but we're also vastly overestimating um, uh, the amount of work that would be necessary to keep it patched, secure, and, and those kind of things. Um, and we're very often not doing a good job at it. So I think the true answer to your question in 2020 is you no. Know, okay. Take one of the established providers who does a good job at it. Okay. 
So last time, questions from the audience. Going once, going twice, and gone. And with that, thank you, Bjorn. Thank you, Christian. That was very interesting. Um, and I would like, I have to find my last background. Where's my last background? My last background is here. So, <laughs> um, so with that, thank you to Christian and Bjorn for the presentation. Um, and in closing remarks, we have one other event this week on Thursday, um, where we have a virtual breakfast. So very early in the morning, 9 a.m. Central European time, but that is an interactive meeting. So you can, we will combine that with the Miro board where we have a lean coffee. So you can put your sticky notes on the board and we want to talk with you about everything and anything. Are we doing the right stuff? Do you have other topics? Do you want a different format? Um, how do you feel about meeting in person again sometime soon? Are you, do you feel safe enough to meet in person again? And, and if so, how uh, and where? Um, should we have a picnic with, with physical distancing? Um, something like that. I don't know. Um, so that's on Thursday, 9 a.m. Join us. There will be a Miro board, so you can bring your own questions and we will discuss them. So not us talking, you talking. You make the agenda, and I will try to stop talking. So I will try to let you talk. Um, and of course, we are back next Monday with Chris Cook from Old Street Solutions talking about Jira reporting for everyone. So join us again next Monday. And last but not least, we are partnering with No Cabin Fever today. So no.cabin-fever.today, um, where you can find a talk every day at 4 p.m. to keep cabin fever at bay till we meet again, wherever. So with that, happy towel day. Again, thank you to our presenters. Have a nice yeah, evening. Actually, Jörg, may I do a shameless self plug as well? Of course you can. Um, if, if any of you guys found the, um, this uh, small section about protecting your APIs and that stuff interesting, um, there was actually no cabin fever talk from me, which goes a little bit more 15 minutes um, into that. So if you look at the uh, past talks there, um, they are on YouTube, um, then you can find that as well. I will add a link to the show notes. All the oh, links, uh, all the links, all the links to the apps and everything go to the show notes and I would have included that. And as far as I remember, you're also part of one or two online conferences in the coming weeks. I don't know if I saw mm -hmm. that right. Could you I think, say a bit more? I think Bjorn, you will be part tomorrow of the Jira day or the day yeah. after tomorrow. Yeah, on uh, Thursday, um, Jira day, I think at three or four uh, PM. And yeah, so that's the next upcoming event. Okay. And uh, Mita and we will be also there, but uh, this is in June or uh, July, a little bit later. Okay, perfect. So thanks again. And thanks for your time. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. -bye.